There we go. Wow. It's very loud. All right. So before I start, I just want to say a very, very special thank you to the British Council for supporting this initiative and making it possible to send the three of us to Scotland. It really was an amazing experience. I'm sure you wish you were there, but <laughs> I just want to say publicly thank you very, very much for allowing us that opportunity. So, yes, please give the British Council a round of applause for what they have done to allow this to happen. So, as Debbie had said, um, I will be presenting an overview of festivals Edinburgh, and I'll also be speaking a bit about programming of festivals generally. Now, this is going to be a quick overview, but I hope that it can be informative to everyone. All right, so what I found really amazing about Edinburgh, besides it being a very historical city, full of art and culture, it really shows that art can transform an entire city. Um, at the beginning of the, of the, or rather, at the end of the Second World War, the first festival in Festivals Edinburgh came to life, and that was the International Edinburgh Festival. And through that, it was identified that Edinburgh would become a cultural resort, or rather, the cultural resort for Europe. Um, they are the world's leading... Did I just go out? Are you hearing me? Hearing you. Okay. They are the world's leading festival city, and they've been able to bring festival tourism to a completely different level. Um, in 2016, they were able to bring in the group of festivals that um, make festivals Edinburgh, was able to bring in 313 million pounds into the Scottish economy. So, to the minister's point earlier, there is definitely a economic benefit and value to the cultural activities that we are doing um, internationally and specifically here in Jamaica. Um, the festivals Edinburgh has also been able to show an international cultural brand awareness for the city and for all the individual festivals that form part of the grouping. Now, I should mention there are dozens and dozens of festivals in Edinburgh, but I'm only going to be reflecting on 11 of them which form festivals Edinburgh. What's also really interesting about festivals Edinburgh and the city of Edinburgh is that the government has a true understanding of culture as an asset, socially, culturally, and economically. And you'll notice that on the screen I have Edinburgh Festival City. The city itself is marketed for its culture. That's the website for the city. And that's the website that you'll find all the information for each of the festivals that happen there. This is supported through the Scottish Government, the City of Edinburgh, Creative Scotland, Event Scotland, Scottish Enterprise, and the British Council. So this is somewhat akin to having the Government of Jamaica with KSAC, JAMPRO, the Ministry of Culture, Jamaica Tourist Board, all coming together to market the city and support each of the events um, within the city or within the festival community. All right, so what makes a good festival? A good festival interrupts the everyday. So we're all continuing our lives. Generally speaking, what we do, a festival makes our lives extra exciting. It concentrates talent in time and place, and it's rooted in community. So that you'll find that residents can be your audience. Your audience can also be your performers. It is a community of, of stakeholders. Each one of you can be an audience member, a resident of Kingston, and also a performer. When a festival is based like this, it gives a certain, I guess, level of authenticity to the festival, but it also protects it because those that are involved in it want to keep it going. So they never want to see it die if they feel that they are themselves a part of what it is the festival is showing. You also want to have accessibility so that anyone can, be, can, can experience the festival that you are putting on. Festivals also allow for experimentation and exploration and they create a dialogue between artists, which is very important when you are in a creative community. Dialogue is what keeps us going and where we can learn from one another and share our insights and feelings. Okay, so I'd like to speak about Festivals Edinburgh is an umbrella arm for 11 separate festivals that happen within the, within the city throughout the year, although the majority or the strong, I wouldn't want to say the strongest, but the most popular ones are in the summer months. 
So I'll start with the Edinburgh International Children's Festival. Now this festival brings in 30,000 people each year. It is a festival that is based solely on children, so people from the ages of zero to 18. And what's interesting about their programming is that they don't program for the entire group. They program for sections. So you'll have a set of programs for children zero to one. So they literally have performances for infants. And then they have one to two, two to three, three to four, and, um, and so on. All of the activities that happen during the children's festival are performance-based, mostly music, theater, and dance. Then you have the Edinburgh International Science Festival. Now, Edinburgh has a strong history for science and innovation. Uh, chloroform was discovered there. Dolly the sheep was created there, the cloned sheep. <laughs> um, but the festival itself wants to show cutting-edge science being accessible to everyone and to all different age groups. So this festival is a two-week festival, and it also has an academic arm that tours primary schools throughout Scotland, and it also has an international arm that shares science innovation. So these are all the festivals that form part of Festivals Edinburgh. We also have the Edinburgh International Film Festival, which is the oldest film festival in the world. It started in 1947 and it's, at its core is social realism. There is a certain level of, I don't want to say Hollywood, but the, the red carpet glamour, along with an accessibility to film and cinema that is quite unusual in a large festival setting and such a well-known film fest festival. Then there's Edinburgh Jazz and Blues Festival. This festival is the largest jazz festival in the United Kingdom. It brings in 68,000 people over a two-week period, but yet it is one of the smallest festivals within Festivals Edinburgh. So imagine, 68,000 is really not that much to some. To us, to me, it would be a whole lot. Um, the Jazz Festival has 170 events over multi a multitude of venues throughout the city. In terms of ticket sales, they sell about 650 thousand thousand pounds worth of, um, of ticket sales. You have the Scottish International Storytelling Festival, which is an oral-based festival. It is uh, two weeks, it brings in 25,000 people, and it is all about our oral histories from, uh, from people around the world. Then you have the Edinburgh International Book Festival, which is the world's largest book festival. In a three-week period, they have over 800 events. And most of these events are, well, they're spread throughout the city in a way, but you have emerging artists or emerging writers showcasing their work, in addition to having Nobel Prize winners also showing their work. Um, you will have very intellectual discussions, you will have workshops, and you will have a chance to meet the authors. It is also a place for networking of, of writers, people in the literary field, and it's also a place to be able to sell your work, as, the, as a number of um, print uh, publishers have uh, booths there and, sh and sell their, their, their books. Then you have the Royal Edinburgh Military Tattoo, which is one of the largest, one of the largest festivals within Ed um, Festivals Edinburgh. They have 220,000 people attend that event over a three-week period. But what's also really remarkable, is they have, can you hear me? They also have an international viewership of, television viewership of over 100 million people. This particular festival, the Military Tattoo, is one of the most popular of all of the festivals. And it is based on dance, music, and military precision bands from around the world. Then you have the Edinburgh Art Festival, which is the youngest of all of the festivals. It is also the largest visual art festival in, all of, in, in the United Kingdom. They get approximately 250,000 people at their festival, and it lasts, well, it lasts for about three weeks, but it could, some of the events will continue throughout the year. What this particular festival does is it showcases visual art, and it brings together all the galleries within the city of Edinburgh, and also artist-run, artist-curated spaces and museums. Almost all of the events in this festival are free, 
and open to the public. There is also an arm of the festival that produces or allows for public commissions of work. So you will have commissioned sculptures and art installations throughout the city, which are then permanent fixtures to what the city has to offer as, a, as a, uh, an art piece, I suppose you can say. Then you have the Edinburgh Hogmanay, which is a three-day festival held at the end of the year. It is a New Year's Eve festival. The first day, they have 30,000 people attend. They walk through the streets with torches, signifying the burning of a Viking flagship. Then you have seven stages set around the city where music concerts are continually occurring. And then you have your New Year's Eve um, fireworks celebration the following day. Everyone goes swimming in the ocean, which is quite cold in Scotland in January. Um, and then they have a thing that they call the New Year's Eve games, or the New Year's games, where individuals throughout the city will go to the National Museum, pick a number, and that number signifies where they are to go throughout the city to discover some kind of art-related piece. Now, I left the last two festivals I want to speak to in a more programming um, sense. This is the Edinburgh International Festival and the Festival Fringe. Now, these two festivals couldn't be more different. They are also the two oldest festivals within Festivals Edinburgh. They started in 1947. Now, the Edinburgh International Festival was started by Rudolf Bing, who was a um, a refugee uh, from Austria, uh, from, the, from the German Nazis. He wanted to create a space outside of um, Germany, and he chose Scotland. It was actually through, uh, I believe his name was Henry Ward, who was the head of the British Council at the time, who suggested Edinburgh as being a great city to host an art festival. Basically, what Mr. Bing wanted to do was show the flowering of the human spirit through art and bring and invite people from around the world to participate. Now, the Edinburgh International Festival is a single curated event, um, so it was his own vision. And it was basically a performance art festival that focused on ballet, opera, music, and, and, and dance, and a bit of theater. Now, when he had his first edition of the festival, eight theater companies from around the UK showed up, and they wanted to showcase their work. But he said they couldn't because they weren't invited to the festival. They weren't a part of his festival. So they decided, you know what? We're going to go ahead and have our own festival. Well, not our own festival. We're just going to go ahead and showcase our work. So those eight theater companies went ahead and had their shows. And a reporter, just after the International Festival, wrote, you know, the International Festival is great, but there were all these other events that were happening on the fringe. And that stuck, and the, the festival fringe was born. So, in terms of programming, the vision of these two festivals is completely different. In the case of the International Festival, it is one man's vision, and it has always remained to this day one man's vision. With the Fringe Festival, on the other hand, it is completely different. It is completely uncensored. Anyone can attend, anyone can be a part of it. In fact, the Fringe Festival has in three-week period, has three, over 3,900 shows, which means there's a show happening every 15 minutes. And there are hundreds upon hundreds of venues. Um, so in terms of vision, you can have one curator, you could have two, you could have five, a group, or you could have absolutely no curation at all, and it can still work. This leads well into the quality threshold. In terms of the international festival, the quality is extremely high. And the curator of the festival goes around the world to pick the very best work that he can find. To be he, um, that they can find. In terms of the fringe, the quality threshold is super low. So you will have absolutely amazing events occur, and you will have the worst things you could ever imagine happen. And worse, it's not censored, anything goes. Um, it's important then, too, to look at your financial model. Within Edinburgh International Festival, they have a 12 million pound budget um, to run their events, and 25% of that is paid 
or is financed through fundraising. The rest of the money is given as gifts. So, you know, when they're talking about a gift and, you know, 500,000 pounds can be given by one person because they love art, you know, that might not necessarily be what's happening for all of us, but that happens at the Edinburgh International Festival. Um, on, the, on the flip side of that, the Fringe, they have, I should mention too, so the Edinburgh International Festival gets the largest chunk of funding from the government out of all of the festivals that happen in Edinburgh. The Fringe, on the other hand, gets a lot less money from the government. How they're able to finance their festival is, one, by ticket sales. They sell 2.7 million tickets in a three-week period. And I just wanted to show you this. Each one of the festivals has their own program, but this is the program for the Fringe. It's like a telephone book. And each one of these things is an event, each one of them. The festival happens, you want to make sure that you collect data. Male, female, age, do they like it, don't they like it? Which events do they go to? What do they support? So then you can help in your future programming. Um, then you want to, can I start clicking yet or no? Okay. Um, then you want to know your audience. You have to understand who they are and program for them. So a fringe audience is going to be maybe more open to events than an international festival audience. When I say that, the Edinburgh International Festival audience might be. Um, I can click? OK, here we go. All right. OK, so. Right, so you want to understand your audience and be appropriate to them. Um, it is also important what your audience can hear. This table is laughing. You want your phone back? Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right, all right. Thank you. All right. So um, it's very important what your audience or your potential audience can hear about you. So let's say, for example, you're putting on a visual arts festival, and you have 60 artists that you're showing. You know who the 60 artists are, but does everyone else know who those artists are? And you know, some artists are not as good as others in marketing themselves. So as the programmer of the festival, you have to also consider marketing them. So it's a new painter from Mauritius. You're bringing them into your festival. You want to make sure that when me as the audience goes to look at your festival online, and I see that you're having this artist, and that artist doesn't have any information about themselves, you have to make that information aware to the public so that the public knows what they are coming to. All right, then there is the issue in terms of programming for venue. An artist. Now, depending on who the artist is, what they're doing, if it is a flute player, uh, that's doing a solo perform. Maybe that, it, that event could go in a smaller venue than where Grand Gala goes. So you want to make sure that you program your, your event or your artist within the right venue. It's also important to make sure that your artist and your audience feel like the place is full. So say we're coming into this room and you notice you're not quite sure what to expect. You think you might get 50 people. So you bring a curtain in to make the room look smaller so that when the people attend the event, they all feel like, wow, this event is crowded. I'm at a cool event. But if you get more than that amount of people, then you can pull your curtain back and you have a larger space within Edinburgh that have come together. The director of each one of the 11 festivals that I spoke to you about before is part, forms part of a board. That board, their basic purpose, they have a couple of purposes. What they do is they have shared programming issues that they sort out. So I'm sure many of you have issues with permitting. You have issues with visas. You have issues that you share that you can go to the government or you can go to whoever you might have those problems with and sort it out with a bit more strength. Strength in numbers. 
You're also able, or rather, festivals Edinburgh, this, the first festival that was a part of Edinburgh Festival started in 1947. This, Edin this festival's Edinburgh didn't start until 2000, when they realized that they needed to come together. Um, it also helps in marketing of individual festivals, but the festival city concept overall. They've also come together on technology and environmentalism. But at the end of the day, their most important role is to advocate as a group to the government, to agencies, to get what they need to get done, done. So that's the end of my presentation. Yeah. But <laughs> So thank you to this table, thank you to that table, thank you for all of us coming together to make something um, work and happen. Um, and I, I just want to end my, my, my section of this presentation with a short video to give you all a sense of what Edinburgh Festivals feels like. My first experience of the Edinburgh Festival was in 1963. I was 17. I went to so many shows, fringe shows, and it was just extraordinary. It's a fantastic introduction to culture, in a way. When I first got to Britain from Swaziland in 1982, I went. Uh, I got here in April, and I went straight to the festival that summer uh, because of its legend. I've kind of launched a, a, my career here, actually, in in many ways. The first one I did was 1984. It's astonishing how many people have started here, how many people have uh, set up their stall and and. and so, sold their wares for the first time in this place. I was a reporter in the newsroom of the Daily Bugle. In a curious kind of way, I'm very rather thrilled. Little <laughs> mastermind, I am in all affected as yourself. The reason they do that is because the audiences are so extraordinary. There's no audience like it. It's like if, if, if you stand up on George Street or, or Prince Street or, or, or up the mound, you, 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 the, you're engulfed in a sort of tidal wave of people hungry for theatre. A thief, the transport screen. A crook, a pirate, a brigand, a rustler. Edinburgh, to me, represents everything that's best about all the arts. So there you go, Edinburgh Festivals. I'd also like to just make one other comment that what they do with their festivals and what I think is probably good for all of us to consider too is that you program internationally but that your audience is based locally. So the strength of your audience is within where you are but you are programming for the world. So just leaving you with that. Good morning. Give thanks for the blessing of your time and attention. And big up for big up again for creating this space to really talk about lot, a lot of what we already know intuitively and impl implicitly, but could benefit from investigating a little more deeply and maybe scientifically. So I'll be summarizing the modules we did on business models marketing and audience development. Okay, so this is an overview of where we're headed for the next 10 minutes or so. We're gonna just take a look at what exactly is a business model. How do you go about deciphering a business model that's right for you and your festival? 
what is this value creating argument and, and how do you create value? What types of value can we even create to begin with? On the marketing and audience development tip, take a look at the experience economy. It's, it's a term that's very popular in the United Kingdom and only just gaining familiarity in, in this part of the world. So we'll take a look at the experience economy and what exactly that is. We'll talk a little bit about engagement and immersion, creating engaging and immersive experiences for audiences. And then we'll also touch on some of the trends, challenges, and opportunities within the zone of, of marketing and audience development in the festival context. All right, so business models. When we talk about business models, we're really speaking of the mechanisms or channels by which a business, in this case, are festivals, create, deliver, and capture value. What is value? Well, the value you create can be one of three sorts typically. It is either economic, in the sense that we know it most typically, money. It can be social, um, in the sense of our Manifesto Jamaica's festival cohesion within a specific space. And value can also be cultural, an example of tremendous cultural value. Jamaica have whole heap of examples like icons of brand Jamaica from Bolt to Mali to Ganja to Reggae, and the list could go on and on and on. All right, so what does a business model entail? What does it tell you? What does it inform? Well, a business model, first and foremost, highlights the problem you're trying to solve. It also highlights your target customer. Who is it you're trying to solve these problems for or speak to? It highlights the value you deliver, whether it's economic, social, cultural, or otherwise. It tells you how you'll reach, acquire, and keep customers. Your business model will also define how you differentiate your offering, what it is you're offering, be it a festival, a product, or a service. Your business model tells you how you generate revenue, how you make money. It tells you what's your cost structure. This speaks to typically to your ratio of direct to indirect cost. So in the context of a festival, our, your typical direct cost is sound stage light, whereas an indirect cost may be administration and your internet and your phone that spans over your entire operations as opposed to just this single event. And finally, it, it gives you an idea of what is your profit margin. What's the, what's the difference between what's going out and what's coming in? Is it working for you? Is your festival working for you? Do all festivals have a business model? In some kind of way, yes. Does the director or producer of that festival always recognize it? Nope. Um, this is quite fine because emergent business models, meaning the ones that reveal themselves as you go along, the ones that you recognize through reflection and retrospect, can be as effective and, and relevant as a more devised business model that you come up with through hours of conversation and consultation and spending whole heap of money with somebody who claims that this is what they're an expert in, right? So emergent models can be as valid and as powerful as, as those that are consciously devised. So just know that sometimes it's okay to go with the flow as you, as you figure this out. So once you've identified a model that's right for your festival, there's a couple other steps that we'll, we were advised to take after that and that I found particularly beneficial in, in running Manifesto Jamaica and the other festivals I, I have worked on. It, the first things first, it's tremendously important to, to assess the environment in which you operate and understand your ecosystem. And you can't tell me if you disagree, but I find that in Jamaica, you just get up and do it because you feel like do it without any, <laughs> without any care for how other people are likely to receive it. And in the context of an event or a festival or a program, if you want people to spend their money and come, the least you can do is give a thought to, to what kind of experience is it that your, your audience wants to have. So in, in assessing the environment, a typical approach is to do um, what is called in, in academic and business spaces, a SWOT analysis, which really means you draw a grid and you take a look at your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and the threats 
presented to you and your festival within the environment within which you operate. So once you know what time it is, you know what climate it is, you know where you are and the ecosystem in which you're operating, you need to devise a strategy for, for putting this business model to work that, that can work in this ecosystem that, that, that you're in. So as you're devising your strategy, you look at things like what market segments will I target? What's my competitive advantage? In marketing, them call it a USP, a unique selling point. What exactly is that? How should I position my festival or my brand in the larger marketplace? Is it that I'm trying to develop new markets? Am I trying to develop a new service? Am I trying to expand my penetration into an existing market? What, what exactly is it that you're trying to accomplish? And then once you've devised this strategy, clearly you need to execute it. You need to act. You need to do something. And not only do you need to act, but with every, with every move you make and every time you, you feel like you make progress, evaluate continuously. Don't just do it at the end when you're done. Just constantly be in reflection mode, evaluation mode. Is this working? How can it work better? You know, what do I need to surround myself with to, to facilitate just constant leveling up? We spoke earlier about the importance of collecting data and not only just collecting it, but analyzing it, because it's enough time we do the survey them and don't aggregate <laughs> the outcomes. So collect and analyze the data. Have actual figures that reflect the value that your festival is delivering. We can't emphasize this enough. And, and know clearly within your heart of hearts the role that your festival plays within the economy and ecosystem within which it operates. And this, this one jumped out at me when it came up um, in the International Festivals Academy course, which is know your breaking point. It's, it's almost the equivalent of, of stress testing steel. When they make steel, they stress it. How much force can this, this actually withstand to know that when they put it in the building, it's not going to come collapsing down on people. We really need to, to, to know and, and take a better stock of, of our breaking points so we understand clearly what funding and resourcing patterns work and do not work for us. So some of the examples of um, working festival models in the UK, Enola mentioned this, ticketing agency, and not only do they take a commission of the sales of tickets that they sell for their own events, but when an international festival's end row is out of season, they are selling tickets for other events within, within Edinburgh and Scotland. So it's a service they offer, so they have a business component to support their, fest, their general operations. Another model that also struck me was the real estate model. So some of the festival bodies in Scotland, they actually have buildings. How they acquired those is an entirely another conversation. But they have buildings that um, they can rent out office spaces, event spaces. So this was another mechanism that we saw people were depending on to, to fund their events. All of this said, one thing that was very, very clear by the time we were at the end of the International Festival Academy course is that the success of the Enra festivals and the secretariat they have founded is a direct result of very strategic, proactive alignment between private sector, public sector, government, and citizens over a long period of time, a long sustained period of time, and at least 70 decades from what we're told, because International Festival Academy, um, Festival Edinburgh is 70 years old. So over decades, over decades, and everybody take it very serious, like the role they play in, in protecting that market share, protecting this economy, protecting the legacy they've built. I was really, really heartened that, that so many people with so many different interests, some care about the money, some care about the art, some care about the citizens, some care about the city. But at the, at the core of it was everybody wanted this ecosystem to grow and thrive to the fullest extent that they know it could. So that was, that was really, really, really key to their success. 
One thing that they, they also highlighted is that there's no precise formula for guaranteeing the sustainability or success of a festival. Festivals are organized and managed so differently. Ex they exist in such a myriad different types of context that it is impossible to devise a formula for success. So what we would all do well with is the courage to, to try and fail well. And we need the bucketive to, to, to be basically to get up and be willing to try and fail again until we find models that are right for our national context. Minister Green spoke about how much money she's lost on you know, festivals she's experimented with the past, and I know we can all resonate with that in, in some kind of personal way, because as festival organizers, a lot of the time is our strength get it off the ground. But um, surround yourself with the kind of support you need to be able to, to take lick down and get up and try and try again until we find models that work for our context. This thing is extremely annoying, but that's fine. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> so moving on. So just to summarize the business model conversation, just some things to think about. How does your organization or your festival create, deliver, and capture value? What are your organization's core behavioral values, meaning your principles, and how does your business model help you to cultivate or maintain those values? What sorts of business models do we need to develop to suit our, our local and national realities? Um, the, in Scotland, they have a very, very well-funded arts council that <laughs> you know, contributes a lot. Currently, we have nothing of the sort. So what are we going to do? We need, a, we need an approach. We need a plan. You know? So I don't know. I'm not saying what it is, but we need something. So <laughs> I don't know. We need something. All right. So moving on to marketing and audience development now. Typically, we think of marketing as, <laughs> some people are going to but I don't business. Flyers, ads, be as enough and ubiquitous as you possibly can. Get as many, many, many people to see those flyers or logos with the hopes that some of them going to decide to spend the money and come to your thing. The acronym is THEME. So the first T, theme the experience. Create a unique world and story around it. The second letter, H, is for harmonize. So harmonize the experiences that people have of your event with positive cues. So make the environment and the behavior and everything in it consistent with the theme of your festival. The E in theme, eliminate negative cues. So ensure the integrity of your experience. Uh, example of this. If you've ever been to Disney World, everybody, staff, characters, they're always in character unless they're backstage. Always. You never see anybody out uh, and just like them, them shouldn't be there in the first place or don't want to be there. So eliminate negative cues to ensure the integrity of your experience. M, memorabilia. Make sure you have tangible artifacts that people can leave the space with. And E, the final E, engage the senses. Install sensory cues. You know, you know how much senses we have? I'm going to say five, but I say seven. So engage the senses. Install sensory cues throughout the venue that resonate with your theme. Right? All right. So generally speaking, there's a shift on the way. Um, and in closing, there's a shift on the way from traditional mass media. Uh, wiki. This is, this is the chart I wanted you to see. This experience economy one that shows the, progress, the progression from commodities to goods to services to experiences, and then it shows you what's relevant to the needs of the customer. This is prob probably something I'm going to share with um, the team so we can send this, because this was really tremendously useful to, to look at. And this is the second one I wanted to show you. The best experiences exist somewhere in that gray area at the intersection of all four, entertainment, educational, aesthetic, and escapist. So, IT has been a blessing 
but it's also been a, a, a challenge. Um, so in addition to, to trending toward more engaging and emerging experiences pre and post event, information technology has presented an asset as well as a challenge, meaning in some places people are opting for the live stream instead of going to the events. So that is something we need to look at. How do you cut through the noise and build your tribe? So give thanks for the time and attention and hope you guys enjoy the rest of the day. Good morning. Good morning. To be on the safe side, I'll have my thing right here as well. So the first thing that I want to say is uh, thank you very much. Thank you to the British Council. It was a wonderful experience for me because, you know, as festival di director, festival manager, you start these things because you love it. Start this conference, this festival, sorry, and then um, you realize that there are so many things that you don't know, and the things that you don't know are overwhelming. The things that you do know, I, I consider myself more of a, of a creative person than a manager. And so when this opportunity came up, I was very excited, and, I, and so I ran to it. All right. So today, I'm going to talk about fundraising, something that I needed to learn about desperately. And I'm also going to talk about making the case. I'll do some research so you can make a case. So the first thing is, this just jumped out at me right away. Edinburgh's festivals are as big as World Cups, according to a survey that they did. Edinburgh's festivals bring in audience numbers on par with the World Cup. 4.5 million, putting them on par with football's biggest international competition and the second only to the Olympic Games. That's a big deal. Now in Jamaica, we have a thing where we say, once you go, you know, and I'm just using it and I'm just leaping off. When you know, you grow. When you know, you grow because use research. That is what they did. They had something called a thundering hooves research, and I'll tell you about it very shortly. But just to say that festivals, first of all, is an ecosystem. The ecosystem includes the public sector, tourists, local attendees, festival organizers, journalists, the audiences, of course. And all of these persons came together, all of these persons who are stakeholders came together to participate in what they called the thundering hooves. And the thundering hooves, the thundering hooves is a group of people who came together because what does it sound like when the competition is sneaking up on you? That's the sound of the thundering hooves. That is what they did. They came together and they formed a group that included the Scottish Government, Scottish Enterprise, Creative Scotland, Visit Scotland, Edinburgh Council, and the British Council. And this group decided that what they wanted to do, their general mission directly, to be the world's leading festival city by supporting the collective cultural and financial health of Edinburgh's festivals. The frame, they decided that they were going to do, research, do research, and the frame, the overall approach, was an outcomes-based framework. And they wanted to find out what happens as a result of experiencing the festivals. And the findings that they got, I have 10 minutes and I'm kind of rushing through. Um, the finding, artistic value, they had five main areas, five or six main areas. And the artistic value that performers value seeing international work. 88% of the respondents said that. Now, I can tell you as a performer, one of the things when, as, as an ASHA member, when I was uh, going through festivals in Spain, France, and Italy as a young man, the thing that I love the most is when you meet up with um, the people from South Africa, the people from Egypt, the people from Uzbekistan, and you got a chance to interact with all of these different artists and performers and groups and see them perform. So that also is what the festival, the respondents appreciated, meeting other practitioners. 79% of them appreciated that. The audiences. The audiences value the festivals for must-see events. 90% of the respondents said that they, they appreciated that. Seeing high quality work from around the world. You know, with a festival, what you see is you get an opportunity to see something that you're just not necessarily going to see in your regular day-to-day -day life. A festival brings things together that you would not necessarily experience generally. Um, audiences are 95% 
satisfied. And it's important that the festivals Edinburgh could get this research and understand this information because it is valuable information that, as Leslie and Enola were saying, that you can use for your advocacy as an advocacy tool. Look at that. Two million potential further attendances. When you have that kind of information, it is very useful information. Agreed? The economy, big deal. Edinburgh festivals bring 245 million pounds into Edinburgh. 261 million pounds into Scotland. Supported 5,242 first-time employment jobs in Edinburgh. And it's bigger than golf tourism. With details like that, with, with facts like that, who is going to say, no, I'm not going to support your festival? Who's going to say, no, I'm not going to support this collective of festival makers? Um, festivals make Edinburgh special as a city. 93% of the respondents said that. Festivals make Edinburgh more likely, meant that they were more likely to revisit um, Edinburgh. 82% of the respondents said that. The social value, civic pride, national identity, community, family time, children's well-being, children's creativity, all of these high values that were brought into being because of the festivals. And environmental waste management, nearly half of the waste from festival offices is recycled, 48%, and they had green initiatives, etc. Now, what do you do with this research? What they did was they used the research to sustain their position and to position themselves for what, for greater things that they wanted to achieve. Bringing it home, just did a little juxtaposition here, Scottish government, Jamaican government, Ministry of Culture, Gender Entertainment, thank you, Sport, Creative Scotland, JCDC, Visit Scotland, Jamaica Tourist Board, I think I may have a little bit of a mix up here, Edinburgh Council, JCF, British Council, etc. But just to say, these are the groups, these are the organizations, the CEOs of these organizations came together to create and to, to do this uh, thundering hooves research so that they could make an impact and get the kind of resources and support that they wanted. And of course, if we're doing it, it's going to be about defining Brand Jamaica, getting investment opportunities, cultural platforms, tourism gateways, social and community development, industry development. Um, you, you, you'll get these slides as well. Yes. Now, now we know, now what? Use it. We use it. When you get this type of information, you use it for advocacy, for fundraising, and for positioning. And um, what I'm going to talk about now, racing into fundraising, because this was the exciting part for me, because I need money for my festivals. I'm not telling a lie. Because <laughs> I, there are three main festivals that I operate with, and that is the Jamaica Dance Umbrella, uh, Talawa Tertiary Dramatic Arts Festival, which is at the University of the West Indies, and the Gungu Walk Festival. And it's, okay. I, let's just say I just need money, yeah? So fundraising, I was very excited when I went to, to this uh, thing because I learned so much. This is the first thing that we know, fundraising, writing the proposal, you're going to get mission statement, goals and objectives, all of the things. These things we know are an integral part of the process of getting funds because that's your, you know, you write the proposal to get funds. So some things I'm throwing out, do's and don'ts. Don't make it too long. Don't make your proposal too long. And some of these are the sharings that I've got from the, uh, the IFA. And some of them I knew before, but some of them I never practiced, although I know them before. You know, you do things because you think that you're just going to do it because it works. And it's not working, but you just feel you're going to do it anyway. All right. <coughs> Sorry. So don't make your proposals too long. Don't focus on your point of view. Do talk face to face. Do make it easy for the person who is reading it to understand and appreciate it. Do fit in with their strategy and their narrative and not so much yours. Yes? Fundraising. So the textbook answer to fundraising, I, I'm saying that, is um, why do people, um, you know, give prestige, branding, because they care about a cause, to receive visibility, tax breaks, etc. And it just, they just, you know, them just drop it from me without warning them say, why do people give? Because they're asked. A lot of the times, we don't ask. We just say, Lord, they're not going to give me no money because, you know. And we didn't ask the one before and, you know, and, and we do things like that. People give because they're asked. Ask. People give because they care. People give because they can. 
So re let's reorient ourselves towards this and build fearlessness in our fundraising machinery. And put it to three C's, connection to you. People give to people, they don't give necessarily to organizations, they give to people. Um, concern for your organization and the capacity to give. This was a big one for me as well. Fundraising, you are not begging. You are not begging, you are fundraising. Now this is important for you to know. It's important for you to know and you have to show up in a way that says I am not begging. I am fundraising, I am giving you access to, your un to a, a unique immersive experience. And if you operate in that way, then I think, in fact, if all of us operate in that way as festival managers, we're going to lift the entire thing higher. Keep what you have. So after your fundraise and you make a little money, give a genuine thank you as opposed to just acknowledgement and um, be good stewards. You know, report back on, on the impact of the work that you have done and how their money has helped you. Um, things like... Uh, what do you do, you know, to engage new prospects and help the, uh, share with the people who have given you money or you want to give you money? Special parties, newsletters, ticket discounts, special events, performances, reserved seats, visibility in printed material, branding opportunities, VIP access, special committee involvement, all of these things, and there's so many more things that we could do. But we have to make sure that we are engaging. Um, this now is, it's always important to check yourself. They have an, a, a Boston matrix analysis tool, and the tool put, uh, had four categories. The rising star category, the problem child category, the cash cow, and the dead dog. The point is, we spend a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of our resources focusing our energy on places and people and spaces that are not really ever going to give us anything. We need to be analytical, we need to be conscious, we need to be careful, and we need to put our resources in the best um, spaces to get the results that we're looking for. So the cash cow, probably is somebody who have holy for money, or an organization that has a lot of money, and is interested in the kind of work you're doing, and might be interested in you. The rising star might be somebody who, is, um, who has some money, and is rising and wants to be able to show that they are rising, you know, and have some philanthropic interests and so on. The problem child may be somebody who has given you money before, and you have to beg them, and them high maintenance, and when you have beg them, it just feel like you're, you're, you're selling your soul and stuff like that. Forget about it. Go to the cash cow. Put all of your energy and resources in the rising star. The dead dog is somebody who might have given you money before, and them said they're not giving you any money, and you're dead, they have begged them and a plead. Stop the begging and stop the pleading. Do some fundraising, do some analysis. Analyze and see what's the best spend for my money in terms of how I'm going to spend money to get money, yes? In conclusion, complete the ecosystem, close the gaps. A strong feedback loop makes for a strong ecosystem. Let's do the research. So the, um, the minister was here, and she said, that some research was done. The, uh, the chairman for JCDC was here. He said that some research was done. Let us start analyzing it. Let us start making a case using this research. It doesn't make any sense to have this thing. And what did you say a while ago? You know, thank you. You see them big words that we can't work with, you know, them financial talk there. But I'm just grateful that I have people like Leslie and Enola. So please, aggregate the results. <laughs> Let us aggregate the results, you know? One hand can't clap. Let the right hand know what the left is doing. Let research inform advocacy and fundraising and even creativity. Close the system. Use what you know for internationalization, innovation, investment, inclusive growth. Pay attention to trends and use them to help you to make the case to all stakeholders. And simply put, when you make a good case, you have a potential to make good money. You have the capacity to do fundraising. If you know who you are, know your community or network, and you know your product. Thank you very much.